Welcome back to the Permaculture Retreat Center channel on YouTube. Today we're going to take a, a, a deep look at all of the factors that I consider are important when buying some land. I mean, it's a good idea to get out of the city. It's hard time. We're going to go a little bit deeper than just the food, shelter, water, climate today. And here we go. Let's get started. Point number one. I'd, I think it's essential to have either family roots from there or at least one strong local dependable contact. And from there you'll get the introductions and when you start to look at different lands, talk to the neighbours to try and understand the weather cycles and stuff like that. But the real anchor point is having at least one person that you can, you can count on and have good advice from and some help because it's going to take a bit to, to get set up. For example, when I came here, I met Eddie, my great mate, um, who's a really good cheese maker and even better mountain biker now. G'day, Eddie. And uh, he helped with tools, helped with advice, cultural uh, understandings, and he's still a good friend now after like seven or eight years. I also had another friend here who, this is a foreign culture, we didn't even speak the same language, but we connected over, uh, over some uh, semi-regular teachers. He fed a horse of mine for a whole year. He stored a lot of furniture that we were given for a whole year. When I think back at what we've achieved, it would have been, and how we've actually managed to enter this community without the help of those two people, it would have been harder to, to be accepted here. A huge factor that I considered, not only looking at the community, the locality that I was moving to, but even the, the country that I was moving to was is it food independent? And that's why we chose Bolivia. And not only is it as a country food independent, but we moved to an area that is productive. It supplies the surrounding areas and, and further cities with food. So it's a great growing climate and it has a lot of independent landowners that are productive. Does your community have a local market? Oh. <laughs> and independently owned stores for essentials like hardware and food because you can't trade with corporate and you may not want to do everything that they they require of you for the new money <laughs> you might be in an area that's full of uh, monopolized or industrialized food production that doesn't really help you they don't sell to the local community but having people that know how to work the land are skilled in it and are producing is, is key because you know for the coming times there's no I don't believe that there's food security if you're the if you're the only one in your community that has that has food you need to be in a place that can stand on its own merits also because while it may be an aspiration of some of you to be completely uh, self-sufficient. It's nice not to have to grow everything, not to have to grow the potatoes or, or the corns or the, uh, the what have you, so, you know, to be able to specialize a little bit and trade. So that's an important factor. If you don't want to have to work all day producing your food, you know, have, thing, have neighbors that are productive also. Living in a productive area, like we're buying half a case of tomatoes for, for three dollars. You know, we can dehydrate them, we can make salsa and the solar oven you know the amount of effort watering and weeding and land that goes into making these tomatoes much better for us to focus on the things we do and living in a in a community that's productive and being able to trade and get by with other things is amazing Do the people believe in people power uh, or like direct democracy and do they have precedence to support that? I had read about the Guerra del Agua, the, the water wars in Cochabamba, Bolivia and how they were trying to corporatize uh, the water of Cochabamba and the people really rejected it. One of the lead activists actually got openly shot in the street but the people blocked the streets and in the end 
overcome the corrupt officials and the intent from that corporation to privatise the water. So that, for me, demonstrated that in Bolivia the people really do have a sense of the power that they hold and, and express that. Going further, because of the communities and the, the sindicatos, we meet, we have a book of acts and, and laws for that, for that territory, so it's really ingrained as part of the culture here. And if, if you're in a place that doesn't do that right now, I suggest that you really start planting those seeds and putting the, learning those processes. Another big thing is, is the culture of the place that you're, con you're looking at. Do the, do the people predominantly recognize common sense? Like, can they apply logic? You know, if you're in an area that people just have no rationale for the needs that they have the, 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 and what we're facing, then it's harder as an individual in these times than it is to be in a place where you know, people can knuckle down and, and, and help, help each other. I'll give you a case in point, like these uh, climate change fanatics, and don't get me wrong, you could call me an envi environmentalist, but these people that want to eliminate essential means of living, essential energy systems, without thinking about how they're going to get by, and, and at the same time being 100% consumers, that to me, I wouldn't want to be in a community that suddenly wakes up all at once with the lights off and with no food on the shelves at home or in the supermarket. That's not a place I want to be in. I'll give you an example, and it's supported by a maxim of law called necessity overcomes the law. So we all just went through a really trialing two years with this uh, government declared pandemic. People were being told to stay home, not to work, that they weren't essential. And for some, they, you know, if they lived day by day or they weren't prepared for that, their needs weren't met. There was a lot of more deaths through suicide in New Zealand, the increase in suicide than the actual flu. Here, because the culture is, is grounded with common sense, people are more connected to nature. Also, in our community, we, we were walking around just saying, you know, if anyone lacks for food, we're going to help them. And if I need to work, I'm going to work. You know, I, I need to work the fields. If I need to get something, go to town. It's nicer to be in a place where that's the common uh, understanding versus a place where people are just completely divorced from nature and, and, and unaware of um, how their necessities are being met. This is an example of small... Um, land ownership here it's probably like ooh, an acre a little bit more and super productive it has onions and and peas it would be easy for me to walk here with my fertilizer and I have and trade some fertilizer for, for vegetables from this owner is there an underlying spirit of connectedness and cooperation do the people recognize that we're all one family to be able to overcome racism or the idea of wars to combat crime. One thing I really like about here in Bolivia is that it has a Catholic foundation. I'm not Catholic, but the principles of the Bible, because they've been exposed to it from a young age, they are, uh, have a moralistic foundation. You know, when push comes to shove, people join together. And this, this ties into a really important point which is if we recognize that we're all one we all, and, and have a biblical understanding there's the creator and then there's all men and women created equally under that and there's no such thing as a privilege that someone can be granted or grant themselves and, and yet deprive someone else of the necessities of life and we're really coming to those times where quite openly we're being told that we will own nothing and they will own everything. Is that what we're going to accept? I think we want to be in a place where people can unify on private property rights, including my body, my choice. So in the present times, we're like predominantly in this engineered society that's been destabilized. The states have been destabilized. A few are going bankrupt already. Before that, demoralized. At any point in time, a switch can be flicked and, and put us into crisis. We're starting to see energy shortages, food inflation, soon food food shortages, uh, a, a, a non-compatible mix of cultures with 
you know, some being paid by the government to live there and others going without. So, yeah, I, th- I think a return to morals and, it, and starting choosing a place that has a moral foundation is going to be very important. Another really important one is how does the community tolerate crime and solve disputes? This is actually something in common to indigenous societies. When you realize that the community can resolve their own things and has local democracy, people can be appointed into positions, and there's also an avenue, a venue, for you to air disputes. If you're in a place where crime is really shunned on and people relate, like if if someone's home got robbed and they had their savings under their mattress or their tools, it takes, it, it could, it could make things really, really difficult for them. So this may seem like a really extreme case to people that have been, you know, are used to the state doing everything that state ran, supposedly independent justice system and lawmaking, legislative and, and enforcement. Let's face it, it's not independent. The communities here, well, they'll put a, they'll put a like a, a scarecrow kind of thing up on a post and they'll say robbers will be hung or killed. And in obvious cases where a car gets stolen by someone in those communities, you will get you will get burnt, you will get killed. The point is, you know this, you're not gonna you're not gonna steal from that community. And and if if someone in the community is getting affected, the rest of the community will join together because of that shared interest in security, respecting private property, and disliking crime to support one another. What's the community's perception of people from? outside the community and overseas. You can overcome it, but it's a lot easier if the community recognizes that people from outside can bring new ideas, innovative practices, different skills. If they're genuinely interested versus looking at you as just as just money, it was one of the really important factors here and it's it's been key to my acceptance in this community. This is how this list is different to other ones that you may have seen just looking at you know, food, shelter and water, that I really do think that community is key to, to thrive, survive and thrive in these coming times. So it's a twofold thing. If you want acceptance in the community, there are obligations that come, come with those benefits. Just today, the community football field, uh, the lawnmower failed, so I, I took my worker there. He's like handy with mechanics. At the same time, I cut the grass. Participate in the community. Don't think that you can be in a community and and separate. You have to abide by the customs and norms. Do the laws locally and nationally allow you to buy land? You could get innovative to have a local owner on the the papers or, or some private contract, but it's important to understand both the state laws and the community customs. For instance, here you can buy land and it be recognised by the state, but unless it's also recognised by the community, you're going to have problems. What essential services can you get and conversely which ones can you get away with? Do you have alternative heating? Do you have enough sun? Do you have wind? Do you have hydro? Do you have water? Do you have electricity? For me, I'd like to have backups, not be, not assume that I can always pay for municipal, for governments, or, or corporate essential services. So it's a big one for me. And we're back at the permaculture retreat center. So another consideration is. It's not actually that hard to grow your own food if push comes to shove. And so what size land do you need for the amount of people that you think you'd want to host on your property? You know, how how many people in your family? For instance, this land that we bought here is like 8,000 square meters, about two acres of land. And that's enough for two families. So eight people to live like uh, self-sufficiently. So that was a consideration. And you should think about it too, like at least be able to feed yourself and your family with the size land that you've got. A really important factor for me is 
would you be happy in that climate and that in your natural surrounds if all goes to custard just by yourself you know when the last set of lockdowns happened we had a little community here we, we could sustain the people that we had to have enough social interaction it was nice on our own property and we have enough nature around to be able to go to the river go to the mountains to entertain ourselves and stay healthy here too so go somewhere where you like the environment what land would be complete without talking about water So water is probably the primary concern, the first consideration that we did wait when looking at this and I suggest you do the same. If you have a good source of water you can always filter it if it's not uh, drinkable but you need to be able to have enough for irrigation uh, to grow your own food. So here we have the traditional uh, irrigation system that comes from the river and we also detected a vein of water that gives probably like 14,000 litres of water every day. And if you use technology like sprinklers and drip irrigation, that can produce a lot of food. So think about that. Where is the water access on your property? How much of it is, uh, is there and, and where do you need to direct it? Can you get electricity to have an electric pump? That's a game changer for us and if not, uh, electricity from the town or from the from a corporation even better independent and we have we installed a solar system here it's a small system but it's enough to be able to power the pump to keep our gardens alive and like a basic uh, cabin energy was also a really a really key factor we are like the last house that has electricity in this direction from the town what other resources do you have that could allow you to be less dependent on those centralized or corporate systems? Do you have wood? Is there a lot of sun? Is there a lot of wind? Could you make, you know, micro hydro? Like, those are definitely key factors for um, where to buy land. And for me, it's quite important to be social too. So I think humans are social animals. I mean, some of you might like to be just by yourselves, especially in the coming times. But uh, if that's the case, then maybe buy a bigger piece of land and, and get some people in there to, to have that social element just in your own in your own bubble. And ideally you'd like the wider community too because you can't have all the skills and maybe you don't want to grow all of your diverse dietary needs also. So um, being somewhere where you, you like the culture and like to interact with the people is, is also a factor too. Living in a community that practices these ideas can give your family, your friends, your neighbors more independence, more confidence, and freedom. And if all the boxes aren't checked where you're looking to buy land that was on this list of things, know that you can always create and contribute. It's really difficult to find all these boxes checked wherever you're shopping for land. So we're launching a course on how to build a community-centric society. And this is based on having lived with two different indigenous peoples, the Māori in New Zealand and now uh, the Quechua um, with the Incan influence in Bolivia. And the more I look at these, the, the indigenous peoples, the more commonalities we see. I mean, we've been told that they were barbaric societies and, and that our focus should be on productivity and economics but when you really look at it with a different measure of, of what makes a society wealthy they were rich in music and in art and in free time and with a, a, an abundance of food everyone was was uh, had a place everyone was respected so I think it's time for us to reevaluate what uh, what what it means to have a good life and, and be wealthy and if you agree with us 
that's living in a in a vibrant community that's that you 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 collaborate with people around you that no one goes short of their necessities then perhaps consider looking at the course but part of the reason that we're doing this as a private course is because these ideas are very very much suppressed but very very needed so and we're happy to be able to share this with you in private and form a community and I believe that if there's just a couple of people in every community working on these initiatives that we're not going to face these global problems at least where we are. Let's have confidence that in every community there are good people and by sharing this knowledge, by appreciating this knowledge and implementing it that uh, that's the solution. That we can foster a better way for future generations learning also from the past. So if you'd like to expand deeper on the things that we discussed in this video, you can go pre-register for our course. The link will be in the description box below. And that's all we have for this video today. So if you've made it this far, thanks for sticking with us, and we'll see you guys in the next video. We're about to get competitive with the music, I think.